and welcome back and today we're working on the vacuum tube computer. All right, this is this is going to get confusing. This is the Bendix G15. It is a full-fledged vacuum tube computer and it is on loan from System Source Museum up in Maryland. And while we are going to do a ton of work on this in the uh, upcoming episodes, today we're not actually working on this vacuum tube computer. We're instead working on that vacuum tube computer. And this is a problem that I never thought I would have, having two vacuum tube computers in the same room, but uh, here we are. This is my vacuum tube computer that I've been building up from scratch. It is based very heavily on the Motorola MC14500 industrial control unit, but I changed the logic unit to a full-fledged arithmetic logic unit so it can do addition and subtraction now. So I've been dubbing this the UE14500, but that name is a mouthful. As a matter of fact, this is about the second or third take I've uh, filmed trying to get this opening because I keep stumbling over the name. So we got to come up with a better name. And internally, we've been calling it Kevin. <laughs> and that's simply because in a previous video, somebody left a comment that said, you should call it Kevin because why not? It would be funny. And we found that hilarious. So internally, we've been calling it Kevin. But if you're not in on the joke, uh, that's a name that's totally lost. So we need to come up with a better name, I think. And I think I'm going to go with UE1. So that implies a couple of things. Saying one implies that there might possibly be a two. And that is definitely something that I want to do. I want to build another vacuum tube computer that has a much better form factor. And also UE stands for Usagi Electric. But when you put U and E together like that, it can mean UE, which means uh, up. So you could, you know, maybe throw in a little Japanese marketing to say like Moto Moto Uwe ni mezashiteru. It's all marketing. Who cares? UE1 I think is pretty descriptive of what this is. So that's what we'll call it going forward. But how are we going to go forward? This whole project kind of came to a standstill this year. And some viewers have been a little worried. Did I abandon the project? What's happening with it? Well, Yes and no. I didn't abandon the project, but I was very unhappy with the direction in which it was going, how we were building it out. The top half here is the uh, processor, but that's only one part of a complete system. And so I started working on building the rest of the system, and that's what we were working on down here. This is the memory. You can see we have two bytes of memory built already, and there was a plan to push it up to six bytes. but. Man, I just don't think that's going to work out very well. I think it's time that we stop working on the memory as it sits, take a step back and reevaluate what the purpose of this machine is, where we want it to be, and how we're going to build it. So it's time for a complete redesign of everything else that's not the UE14500 up here on top. So that's what we're going to go over today. Let's take a look at some printouts that I have that'll show you where we were, what the original plan was, and why I nixed that, and what the new redesign is. And then at the end, we'll build the new board, one of the first new boards for the new system, and hopefully maybe get a little bit of power into it to give it a test. So let's get to work. All right, let's start by reminding ourselves what the architecture of the processor looks like. Uh, I think this processor design garners a lot of confusion because it is a one-bit processor, but it has a four-bit instruction. But a lot of people think that the four-bit instruction means that it's a four-bit processor, but we call it a one-bit processor because the data bus that is being used to store bits into memory or read bits from memory is only one bit. And then that data bus is gated to get to the ALU by the input enable register and again gated to get to the write pin by the output enable register. And then the ALU has a serial carry register that loops back around as uh, an operand to the ALU. And then we have the result register as well. Both the carry and the result register latch on the falling edge of the clock while everything else happens on the rising edge of the clock. It's a pretty clever design, but by itself, it's really not that capable. It needs a lot more to go with it. So we had this plan to create this kind of uh, overall system here. 
and the processor, the UE14500, is just one part of that. The next big part that I was working on was the memory, and then we had to find some way to have program control, some way to clock the entire system and get it to actually execute stored programs, and for that I was planning on using magnetic tape. And then input and output to give us a serial out to maybe talk to a teletype uh, was something that was planned for far in the future. And then over here on the left, we had thought maybe we wanted to expand the memory because, well, ultimately six bytes of memory is just not that much. So that sounds really weird. Why did we only have six bytes of memory? Why couldn't we run a whole lot more? Well, it kind of came down to space. I was building the memory to work off of pure vacuum tubes. And uh, because of that, it was going to take up a huge amount of space. And I wanted to keep the control word as minimal as possible. Because we're only dealing with one bit at a time, a large memory address doesn't really address that much memory. Uh, here I'm showing a 6-bit memory address with an additional 2 bits for banking the memory, but we can think of this as being a total 8-bit memory address. Now, an 8-bit memory address should give you access to 256 locations, and if you have an 8-bit data bus, that gives you 256 bytes. But because we have a 1-bit data bus, we only have 256 six bits. And then the high order 4 bits was our 4 bit instruction. This 4 bits gives us these 16 instructions over here and those are the ones that we absolutely have to stick with because they're baked into the process. Now going back to our uh, large layout here, we needed to build the processor which is done and finished. We needed to build memory and that's what I was currently working on. And the design for that uh, looked a little something like this which <laughs> As you can see, looks absolutely bonkers. This was going to have something like 280 vacuum tubes on it, and it was only going to net us six bytes of memory. It was going to use a phenomenal amount of power for an incredibly tiny amount of storage space. And, well, it was going to be a huge amount of time to build this. Each one of these memory boards takes about six hours to cut and six to eight hours to solder up. So it would have been an incredible undertaking to tackle all of this. And at the end, I just don't think we would have ended up with something that was remarkably more usable. So it's time to pivot, and I think the best direction to pivot in is to actually take another page out of Motorola's handbook. So this is the block diagram for the minimal ICU system outlined in the Motorola MC14500 handbook. Uh, it looks quite complex, but really all we care about are the large boxes. Right in the center we have the MC14500, this is the ICU, that is essentially what we have built in tubes. On the top we have two 4-bit binary counters to give us an 8-bit memory address that goes into a ROM that gives us an 8-bit data output. So there are 256 instructions that can be stored in this ROM, and then the 8-bit output, four of those go to the MC14500, and the remaining four are used to control what is being stored where. The three boxes that we have on the bottom are split up into essentially scratch pad RAM, an output register, and system inputs. The output register is an actual addressable latch. We just throw a 3-bit address into it to select one of eight outputs, and we store whatever is on the data bus in one of those outputs. Now it's important to note that we can't read what is in that output register. It is right only memory, which sounds hilarious saying it out loud. Now in the middle we have the scratch register. Again, this is a 3-bit latch, but we can actually read from it. So we can write a bit into memory and then read that bit back out later. And then on the far left, we have system inputs. This is not a register. It is just reading some external input coming into it. So it's just an addressable selection thing, I guess. Uh, now it's important to note that one of the bits is actually RR. So we only have seven external inputs coming in but we don't need to build any memory into this. So this is read only. And so this is an incredibly simple system and we've actually built up exactly this on a single PCB. I'll put a link in the description below to that video. It was a really cool video and a really cool system. So this is what I want to build for the UE1 vacuum tube computer. 
we've already built the UE14500 and we already have uh, two bytes of RAM on there. We can use one byte of RAM using our interesting vacuum tube and VFD combo to get our scratch register here in the center. That requires almost no modification whatsoever. So we already have two of our seven blocks here taken care of. The input is not a register, it's just addressable. So we do have to build some new logic to select which one of these bits we want to select from, but we don't actually have to build any memory for this. So that one's relatively easy. And the output register over here, we can use the same basic design that we have for our scratch register, but we have to make a slight modification to it to allow us to read individual bits out. So unfortunately, I can't reuse the boards that I already have for that. I'll have to cut new boards. That just leaves the 8-bit program counter and the 4-bit binary counters up here. These alone would require a colossal number of vacuum tubes, but it's important to note that we're down to just eight bits for our control word. Eight bits just so happens to fit perfectly onto paper tape, uh, which means we can eliminate all three of these boxes up top here and all of the tubes that have to go with those if we just run paper tape. We can use the eight bits coming out of that to select our address and select our instruction. Now there are some limitations to this. We can't jump, but you couldn't jump in this original minimal ICU configuration anyways. And we can get around that by using looping tape with uh, maskable inputs and outputs using the IN and OEN registers. So what does this look like if we black box the paper tape and deal with it later and then build the logic for everything else? And well, that's what this logic diagram right here is. Uh, you can see the upper half of this is just the UE14500. The rest down here is just the scratch register and the output register. And you can see there's minimal supporting circuitry that needs to be built for this. That's because we're picking up the lion's share of complexity with the paper tape itself. This is actually very reminiscent of how vacuum tube computer manufacturers like Bendix with the G15 would lean very heavily on the rotating drum. Only in this case, we're leaning on paper tape instead of a drum. Keeps things very simple. So I spent a lot of time uh, redesigning and this was the design that I ended up with. And you can see there's a giant box here in the center that says paper tape. That's our paper tape black box. We're gonna deal with that later after we get everything else built. Here on the bottom, you can see our scratch register and the two boards underneath it for the output register. And then along the sides, we just have the supporting circuitry for that. And then right up here on the top, we've got a uh, soft start and we've got our input control that has seven external switches on it plus the inverters necessary to make that work. So this is our game plan moving forward. And this is why there hasn't been any updates on the system for so long. But here it is fully redesigned and ready to start building. And the first thing that we're gonna build, I think is the seven bit input. This is an incredibly simple board. It's just seven toggle switches that go into seven inverters but we also have pins leading off to a header that can also toggle those inverters. So we can have something truly external to the system toggling this input. Uh, now you'll notice that there are eight vacuum tubes and <laughs> that eighth one is doing nothing. I am simply using it as a series resistor for the other seven <laughs> vacuum tubes. Because I run my filament strings in a series, I have 24 volts coming in and I need to have four vacuum tubes and I only needed seven tubes. Now I could run a big uh, dropper resistor here instead of a vacuum tube, but I have like 2,000 6AU6s and I only have like 20 dropper resistors. So it made more sense to use a 6AU6 as a dropper resistor. Plus I think it looks a little better. Uh, so please don't hate on me too much for having a useless tube in this design. Uh, ultimately aesthetics won out on this one. So let's get to work building this board and I'm gonna cut the PCB on our uh, Bridgeport three axis CNC mill. All of the PCBs for the UE14500 and the memory boards that I've already built were all cut on this same mill using the same copper clad stock. If you wanna know more about how I design my PCBs, how I export them to G-code, and how I ultimately set up the mill for cutting, I actually have a video dedicated completely to that. Again, I'll put a link in the description below if anybody wants to go check that out. However, I haven't cut a PCB in a while and I didn't quite get it 
correct on this one. Uh, this is a huge PCB. It's about 490 millimeters wide and I didn't get it perfectly flat. So I actually had to go through and uh, clean up a lot of the cuts on the right side of the board with a knife afterwards. Uh, but it was time to start soldering this board up and I use these little one millimeter uh, PCB mount pin headers for my tube sockets. It looks like the tubes are soldered directly to the board, but you should never solder a tube into anything. So these are actual sockets that I am building directly into the PCB, and so far they seem to be working beautifully. Uh, once we get all the passives in, we'll start work on getting the toggle switches in. And these are Soviet era toggle switches that I found on eBay for relatively cheap, and they look great, uh, but they do need a lot of support. So we actually cut out an extra support piece that sits on top and then I'll put in some standoffs that hold that support piece in place and everything should be very rigidly mounted now. And here is the finished product and I think it came out looking absolutely stunning. I am just in love with the way that these uh, seven switches with their support structure and standoffs look. I think that came out looking really great and it actually fits kind of the aesthetic of the whole thing. I'm also really glad I used the eighth tube over here even though it's doing nothing. I think it would have looked funny with seven tubes and a big dropper resistor over there. It looks really uniform and clean like it is. Now I've got it hooked up to a seven segment IV26 VFD down here, which works great because we have seven outputs coming out of our inverters up here. Uh, and I haven't actually tested this yet. With the way that all of the switches are turned, I believe this will be pulling the grids high of each of these, which should pull the outputs low, which means none of the VFDs should kick off. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't actually know if that's the case. Uh, I don't even know if it'll even power up. So let's go ahead and flip the power switch and uh, see if it all goes up in smoke. Well, all of the VFDs came on, but that could be because the tubes are warming up. Yeah, I can see the tubes, the filaments are starting to warm up in this one at least. Oh, a couple of them turned off. That's a... Uh, four of them have turned off. That's kind of good news. <laughs> Three of them have not turned off. <laughs> That's not good news. <laughs> Uh, let's see if we can figure out which three are not turning off. Yeah, these three switches on the end here aren't doing anything. Uh, that one works, that one works, that one works, and that one works. These four switches work, these three switches do not. Um, those three switches go to the very end here, so maybe I've got something funky in the heaters for those. I don't know if those are warming up. Let me troubleshoot that right quick. All right, fault found. See this vertical jumper right here that I'm touching with my probe? This is coming off 24 volts and going into the filament of this first 6AU6 here. Uh, then we drop six volts across that, go to the next one, drop another six volts, go to the next one, drop another six volts, go to the last one here, drop six volts and come out of the filament from it to ground. And then the next four are uh, set up the exact same way, except that if you look at the jumper here that's going into the filament of this first tube, it's a lot shorter. And that's because I routed this filament to ground. So it comes out of ground into this tube, through all four tubes and then back into ground. We never get 24 volts into the filament string here, so these tubes never get warm, which is why they never kicked off. I'm gonna need to uh, cut this jumper and uh, create a little bodge maybe to 24 volts. Just a silly routing mistake, but we'll fix it as best as we can. There we go, easy peasy fix. I just removed the old jumper, drilled a new hole in the appropriate rail by hand, and then put a new jumper in place, and you can't even hardly tell that I made a bodge there. So that came out really well. And I've got it all hooked up again here, so let's flip the power switch, and hopefully we see all the lights come on, and then all the lights go off as the tubes warm up. Uh, there we go, we lost a couple already. Tubes are warming up in an interesting order there, we can really see, but yeah, check it out. All seven VFDs went off, so let's flip the switches one by one and turn all seven back on. There's one, two, three, 
four, five, six, and seven. Our input panel is now working 100% perfectly. We have built the first new piece for our redesign, and I am really excited and amped up about this redesign. So hopefully we can make a lot more rapid progress on it as we build out more pieces. So I wanna thank you guys so much for joining me on this redesign journey that we're embarking on, and I hope to see you next time.